Welcome to University Drive, your pathway to the transformational work of University of the Bahamas. Our goal is to build a better Bahamas by shaping tomorrow's leaders today, finding solutions to challenges and forging new opportunities for growth. University Drive, where faculty, staff, students and alumni travel the road of progress together with you. Hello everyone and welcome to University Drive. I'm your host Tamika Lundy. This is season seven of our show, University Drive, the Bahamas Living Wages Survey. Have you ever heard of it? What is it? Well, joining us today are two guests who have been involved in developing the report for the Bahamas Living Wages Survey. We have joining us Lesbie Archer, who is Policy Fellow at the Government and Public Policy Institute at University of the Bahamas. And then we also have Brittany Johnson, who works in the Office of the Vice President of Operations, but who served as a researcher with the study. Ms. Archer and Ms. Johnson, thank you so much for being here with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having us, Ms. Lundy. Yeah. It's great to be here. Thank you for having us. You're quite welcome. And lastly, this is your second time joining us. So I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit. Tell us about the Government and Public Policy Institute and what it's been up to lately. I'm really excited to be a member of the Government and Public Policy Institute team. We are a research institute at the University of the Bahamas. And we facilitate research on areas involving public policy, general public interest. We have been involved in the Sustainable Development Goals, in the National Development Plan, conducting this living wage study um, with Hurricane Dorian. We also have interns. We had an intern come from McGill University and do research in that aspect. Um, COVID-19, we put forth a reopening strategy for the government to take into consideration during the early parts of the pandemic. Um, agriculture, our reach is pretty far in terms of increasing and taking advantage of the research skills at the university and providing empirical data from which solid public policy decisions can be made for the betterment of the Bahamian people. And it all sounds like very interesting work, you very relevant work as well. Uh, you've been working on kind of the macro level and we all know that a lot of things that happen on the macro level also trickle down to impact things on the micro level. So it all sounds very interesting. But for the purpose of our conversation today, we are talking about the Bahamas Living Wages Survey. Let's start first by explaining what is a living wage? So a living wage is basically at, it, at its basic level, a wage that enables workers to afford adequate shelter, food and to be able to take care of their basic needs without having to work overtime or without having to take on a second or third job. So you make one salary and with your salary, you can afford to live a decent um, and comfortable life in the Bahamas or in whatever country the living wage is, is set in. The intention is to prevent people who work from going into poverty. And that's also the principle. The principle is that if you work, you have a right to live a decent and basic life. Um, what do we mean when we say decent living? That might mean different things to different people. What do we mean when we say that? So in that regard, it would be more so when we say decent living and in conjunction with the living wage, it's a wage that would be high enough to provide as well as maintain a normal standard of living. And then for decent, as Leslie would have stated earlier, it would be so that a family was able, is able to afford a standard of living that is beyond mere subsistence. So whereas they can afford to meet their physical, emotional, cultural, as well as social and other needs that need to be met for each family member. So, and to determine basic and decent, we used international standards. So we went to the WHO website, what is their standard requirements for a decent house? How many people should live per square feet? Should there be windows? Um, how should the ventilation be in the house? So we looked at the international standards. We also looked at the local standards. What does the Ministry of Work say 
is a decent house for a person to live in and and what and then we're going to find out well, what is the rent for this decent house or this house that meets the requirements and in addition to those standards we also went and spoke with people with people who make low wages how are you living how much does how much does your bills cost or what are your expenses to put it differently what are your expenses what do you pay for rent what do you pay for your groceries each week and what is that total together and using those three components the international standards local or national standards and the voice of the people we were able to decipher or to clarify what we mean by a basic and decent living standard and of course that differs per country but even in the bahamas that differs per island and so we had to do that in in studying it for nassau and grand bahama we had to take that into consideration as well to speak to people on both islands yes i can see how that would differ so now i'm very very curious as we talk about all these definitions why focus on the living wage and not the minimum wage and what's the difference what's the relationship between a living wage and minimum wage so that's a common question it's a really good question the basic differences i can give uh, one is that the minimum wage is a mandatory requirement and across the board the living wage is a voluntary requirement by that businesses impose upon themselves now sometimes people use the terms they intermingle with the terms but there are clear differences such as the mandatory versus the voluntary aspect of it also with the living wage it alters over time whereas pretty much as the cost of living increases or decreases the living wage would alternate whereas the minimum wage is just a set standard and a set wage that's given to workers and the third point to bounce off of Brittany is that the minimum wage is often politically affected or is often used as a political tool whereas the living wage is independently almost often independently constructed and as Brittany just said more determined by cost of living factors than the political climate or to be used um, as a political influencer all right thank you for that explanation i think those were quite helpful so have we ever done a living wages survey for the bahamas before so this is an interesting question because discussions about a living wage in the Bahamas are certainly not new. When you go through the newspapers every now and then you will see union leaders calling for a living wage, you will see politicians calling for determinations to find out a living wage and there are estimates out there to that have been done by unions um, to establish what a living wage is. There are international estimates that determine what's the cost of living in the Bahamas and how much a person would need to make in order to live a certain lifestyle if they want a certain um, path. But so it's, it's not new. Um, what we have done is new to the Bahamas in using the ICA methodology to calculate the living wage. Um, but we also take in consideration the other estimates that have been done to see where our number fits and falls in to give context. So this, so, so the results of this survey, there are official results, um, official results for the Bahamas. Well, you know, the thing about research is that it's, it's, it's the results based upon the methodology. So there are over 100 different ways to determine a living wage estimate. That's almost like saying there are a hundred different ways to skin a cat, right? And depending on the path you follow, it's going to influence the results you get. So while one union recommended that a livable wage would be $350 a month, another union said that, no, in the Bahamas, you need $450, I mean, not a month, a week, $450 a week. Um, but our methodology says something different as well, because we might have taken in factors that they may not have taken in. So based upon the method that we took, the way we chose to calculate our estimate, then that reflects the, 
costs um, or the salary that's needed. And if somebody chooses another method, there may be a different result. And I'll give you an, an example. In London, in England, they use the minimum income standard method. And in order to calculate the living wage, what they do is they invite persons from the public from different communities, be they pensioners, um, uh, baby boomers, uh, young persons. They say, what do you need to live in London? They say, oh, we need a TV. We need three chairs. We need two beds. We need four pieces of clothes, two jackets, and three jeans. They take all of those, whatever the consensus is, and then they go and they find the prices of all of these items. And then they say, well, this is what a person needs. This is how much everything's costs. And so this is the salary that they need to get in order to maintain this. And that, if we were to do that in the Bahamas, that would be probably give us a different figure from the way we went, where we chose to look at international standards or what exactly is the bare minimum, you know, that the WHO says, what is the bare minimum for the Bahamas and what is actually happening? And then we, cal we calculate that. So, to say it's a national um, living wage, it, it would be probably pushing it a little, <laughs> but, but there's certainly um, some er empirical evidence, some grounded, re well-researched evidence that can give you an idea of what it's like to live in the Bahamas and how much you need to have a basic but decent standard. All right, thanks for that. We'll get a we'll uh, get into talking about methodology more later. But for right now, what was the period for the study? What is the date of release of the study, and who worked on on the study? So the period of the study yeah. was October two thousand nineteen to March two thousand twenty. At least this was the period of time when the field work was done, as well as the analysis. And then thereafter, the final report was submitted in September two thousand twenty. Team, the team members included, in addition to Brittany and myself, we had Professor Olivia Sanders, a well-known economist, Professor Bridget Hogg, another um, very good researcher at the university, and we had Dr. Vijaya Permiwal, who is based at UB North campus, and helped us out with getting the Grand Bahama data. All right, so from the period of November 2019, you said, to March 2020, which is, that's a significant month for October, us. October, October 2019. Sorry, October, October 2019 to March 2020, um, a study was conducted. Tell us how specifically that was done. I, I do recall, Lesvi, you had said that the islands studied were New Providence and Grand Bahama. How did you determine that those would be the only uh, two islands um, for the study before we talk about what exactly happened? Initially, the study was planned for the entire Bahamas, for all of the islands, and that is still very much a part of the plan. Um, but of course, we started with um, home base here in New Providence, um, the urban environment of the country, and then we did Grand Bahama. Um, Secondly, um, which, was, which was interesting because the hurricane had just passed, but we decided to continue just to understand, you know, how, how Brittany said it before, the way people were adjusting and how they had to live in a post-disaster climate because you still at the end of the day have to live, right? You still need housing, you still need food, you still have basic needs and you need to go to the doctor you know, need your own social well-being. So to be able to capture that environment, we, we felt that it was a good opportunity to get data on what happens after a crisis um, in terms of the cost of living for the people there. But the study is still um, extending. We have a survey online format to cover all of the islands of the Bahamas um, online so far. Um, until, you know, if the COVID, depending on COVID-19, if we will be able to go into the field, into the places and do more field work. I'm curious about whether the factors that impact the uh, living wage would change in a post-pandemic environment. We have questions about the cost of food right? At some point, that would be raised. Um, it would be interesting to see 
how food prices are impacted in the long run. Um, I am thinking like, and we'll get to it later when we talk about sustainability and emergencies, but the amount of funds that people probably put aside for emergencies may probably increase. And that, that's what I'm thinking basically. Also, you know, um, super value last week in the newspaper, uh, Mr. Roberts, he said that there's a change in buyer's preferences at the food store and there seems to be a greater purchasing of fresh fruits and vegetables than of canned goods and and those preserved products and that to spend more money on fruits and vegetables that could be an indicator that may affect the living wage or another post pandemic because we don't know when this will be over will also be government and public policy what prices will be or what items will be given vat free because as of now there are no fruits and vegetables that are vat free on the list so the prices that or the taxes that are applied to certain food that may affect the cost of a living wage as well but it's definitely certain something certainly something to think about Okay, so let's get into what happened during those those months. What, how exactly did you undertake the study? So our first step was to go and find out the prices of food, of the food items, um, the cost of the basic but healthy and delicious diet that a person would need. And to do that, we interacted with the Ministry of Health, their nutritionists. They came up with a culturally palatable meal. We went into the food stores. We did 11 grocery stores across New Providence and three in Grand Bahama, each of different sizes. So we went into the convenience mom and pop stores to get their prices. We went into the typical standard grocery stores to get their prices. And we also went into the wholesalers to get those prices. And we got the average of each of the prices. So for example, for breakfast, the nutritionist said tuna and grits with the food on the side. So we got the average price of grits and tuna. And in the quantities recommended for 2000 calorie diet per day. So after we did that and we broke everything down, it came down to about $10 a day per person for a breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks. And that includes your tuna and grits for breakfast, your mashed potato and fish for lunch, or your mashed potato and your, sorry, your mashed potato and your chicken thigh for lunch with your vegetables, carrots and cabbage, and for dinner, peas and rice, um, fresh fish and a salad. Again, with the snacks, you have your choice of peanuts, um, peanut butter, you know, fruit, those type of things in between. But that comes down to about $10 a day. So we calculated that first, the food. And then we went to the housing requirement and we got the standard. I think, Brittany, you did that. You help determine or help us understand. Oh, we'll explain that process. Okay, so for the housing that we use, we actually use the checklist and this checklist is pretty much based on as well on local as well as international housing guidelines of what an appropriate housing structure should be. And just for example, um, things involved in checklist is the size of the home, as well as how many rooms within a home, as well as if the room has, um, you know, appropriate ventilation, especially considering the amount of persons residing in the home that we would have did the analysis on. And based off of that, then we would have determined if the housing was suitable based on the standards that were checked off or not checked or were not um, checked off based on the housing that we would have visited. And then once, okay. you would have, once you would have amassed all of that, then what do you do with that information? Well, once we have that information, we then have to go to the statistics and the secondary data, which, is, which was compiled by the Department of Statistics to understand what people spend on their other quote unquote essential needs. And that would include education, healthcare, transportation, um, or 
their casual spending, such as going to the movies or eating out at a rest, what do they spend just as a normal Bahamian? That information is already compiled per something known as the housing expenditure survey that occurs around every decade. So we went to the last housing expenditure survey conducted by the Department of Statistics. They have the ratios that person spent uh, on average, depending on their income, their level, which how much they make and how much they spend on certain categories. So we took that information and we did a little Excel magic with it and it aligned with our information in terms of the $10 a day per food and then we got the housing prices and we put that together. Also with the housing, what was very important as well as with the food was our designated field work areas. So we did not go out west. Uh, we went in the Coral Harbor area, but not out west Cable Beach. And we didn't go further Adelaide, um, Mount Pleasant. We focus on areas that have a high rental population because the survey said that a large number of persons in Providence rent homes. And that would have been most of the inner city area and out east, or I would say north of Blue Hill Road, south of Blue Hill Road, and central Nassau. That's where we focused on homes that were in those areas and the food stores that were in those areas. And we took that and we got with the secondary data from the housing expenditure survey, and we compiled all of that together on an Excel spreadsheet, and we came up with a figure that one person needs to survive or to live comfortably or decently in the Bahamas per month. And then we multiplied that by the reference family size. So what is that figure per month? So that figure per person or for an individual or for a family? Tell me all of the figures that are relevant because I'm sure people are eager to find out all of those figures. Okay, so in New Providence, like I said, the meal plan is about $10 a day to have a nutritious and culturally palatable balanced meal. It's $10 in New Providence, but it's $13 in Grand Bahama for the same meal. Um, with the housing, we found the most affordable accommodations in the inner city around Mason's Edition. Nice two bedroom houses because we took in consideration children and those were about $400 a month. And the same two bedroom houses in Grand Bahama were about $700 a month. We did water, electricity and gas how much they paid, as that would be cooking gas, I mean. The, to get this figure, we asked for low wage workers, we said, well, how much do you pay per month? On average, do you spend on electricity, gas, and water? We also went to the housing expenditure survey again, and other surveys from the Department of Statistics to see what they say is the average cost of these utilities that persons from low wage uh, areas or urban areas live. And in addition to that, we also went to the, the businesses themselves. So we spoke with persons from the um, BPL and we said, okay, we wanna know what is the average cost of electricity a home would pay monthly in this area. And so we got those figures in. So water was around $50 a month, which is standard. Electricity is $140 a month. That a low income family would be paying and gas was around $30 a month. That's a $30, you know, the small tank, I mean the 20 gallon tank. They said they pay around $30 a month for it. Grand Bahama, their water was around $35 a month. Electricity, $149. So it was around the same that they pay in the Providence, which was $140. And this was at the time. So this was before I understand BPL has made some changes. So this was last year before these changes came into effect. And their gas bill was around $18 a month. Uh, whereas the province was 30. Obviously, in Grand Bahama, that price difference is influenced by the fact, in part, that they have a lot of 
electrical stoves instead of gas stoves. There, yeah, that is a dominant, um, that is a dominant cooking use. And these figures also align with what the housing expenditure survey estimates were extant for Ingra and Bahama. Um, we think the rental price was higher than what it was when the survey was first done. So I know it, it may be a bit difficult just hearing numbers and figures flying out. <laughs> it, 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 it may be confusing, but the bottom line is per month for a family of four, you need around $2,200 a month in New Providence and around $2,800 a month in Grand Bahama. The factor that increased the Grand Bahamas price so much because a lot of people would think well moving to the islands would be cheaper was the housing their rental costs are more expensive than for example an urban area in New Providence and some people have said well okay that's understandable because Grand Bahama wouldn't really have an equivalent of Mason's edition so it's a suburban and then the food costs and I learned that because, for example, we have on our food list that the nutritionist constructed for us, peanuts. You go buy a pack of peanuts from the peanut man a day for a dollar in Nassau. But when you go to Grand Bahama, those same bag of peanuts cost $2. So factors like that. Also on Grand Bahama, there is less larger quantities of items. So we sent our Grand Bahama team and said, well, okay, get the 10 pound bag of chicken. You know, in the food store, they have the 10 pound bag of quarters for $9.99 or $12.99, depending on where you shop, which food store you shop at. And the researcher, who, our team member that was in Grand Bahama, she was like, Leslie, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have that stuff there. We don't have, we don't have these things in Grand Bahama. We only have the small package of this. We don't have um, turkey like that. We don't have this. Um, so that supply, also affected the cost and we don't know if it's, it was due to Dorian or if that's just the way of life in Grand Bahama but further research will help us come up with answers to those questions. So Miss Archer you've shared quite a lot and we're going to get down back to that um, to the extent that we can considering that time is really going but I want to stick a pin for two reasons one because I want to look back at some of the things that you've said and secondly because we have to take our first break so you're listening to University Drive we were talking about the Bahamas Living Wages Survey that was conducted by a team from the Government and Public Policy Institute at University of the Bahamas we'll take our break now and be back after this To protect yourself and others from COVID-19, stay home as much as possible and avoid close contact with others. Wear a mask that covers your nose and mouth when you leave home. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Practice social distancing. If you must leave home, stay at least six feet away from other people and disinfect items you must touch. Limit in-person contact as much as possible. To prevent the spread of COVID-19 if you're sick, avoid public transportation, ride sharing, or taxis. Stay home if you're sick, except to get medical care. Remember to call ahead first. Separate yourself from other people and pets in your home. Everyone is at risk of getting COVID-19. Older adults and people of any age who have serious underlying medical conditions may be at higher risk for more severe illness. This message is brought to you by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and University of the Bahamas. Welcome back to University Drive. We are talking about the Bahamas Living Wages Survey results. Um, the study was conducted by a team from the Government and Public Policy Institute at University of the Bahamas. Ms. Archer, before we took the break, you were talking about some of the details of the study, but I do recall that you said that according to the results um, of the study that was conducted, uh, for a family of four the to, to live basically but decently, um, they would need to be able to survive on at least $2,200 in New Providence, that reflects food, housing, and non-food, non-housing, and then $2,800 for the same family of four in Grand Bahama. Food and housing, that's self-explanatory, but what are, what are the non-food 
non-housing items that would come into that those two figures? The non-food, non-housing items that included that $2,200 a month for New Providence that included, like you said, the housing, the food, and the non-food, non-housing items such as the transportation, uh, taking the bus or renting a car, the education, health care, um, uh, social activities. Uh, but that's not all that a living wage is about. So that's only a part of the calculation. We then have to take in an additional amount for sustainability and for emergencies in case something happens because as we all know life happens right so and without even considering the pandemic our history with hurricanes with evidence that sometimes unforeseen circumstances or events or expenses can affect the long-term welfare of persons and their families that's also why we have insurance because we don't know what's going to happen and sometimes you can an unforeseen circumstance can spiral you into death, into poverty of which you can't recover from. So built into the living wage is an amount for specifically for the unexpected. Most living wage studies, like I said, there are over 100 different methodologies. They always put between 5 and 15% of the wage calculated so far for that unexpected. And I put in our survey, our team, we decided to go with the bare minimum, which was 5%. Um, so we added that 5% for sustainability and emergencies. However, following some minimum wage studies, we also added an additional percentage for savings and investment. The living wage study that was conducted in Jamaica also did the same. Put aside or built into the wage, something aside, for your savings and investment. And the principle justifying that is that low wage workers don't want to stay in their position. They want to build and elevate themselves to a higher level, a higher standard of living, something that's even more comfortable than the basic but decent level of comfort. So we add 5% for sustainability and emergencies, 5% for savings and investment. That's just a reasonable amount. And that comes up for a family of four to around $4,400 a month in Nassau, in New Providence, sorry, and $5,750 a month in Grand Bahama. So that's $4,400 in New Providence and $5,750 in Grand Bahama with those additional percentage increments for the unexpected and for the desire or the ambition to elevate. So that's the cost of living for a family of four, two adults and two children in New Providence, which is $4,400 a month, and in Grand Bahama, which is $57.50 per month, and not $57.50, $5,750. A family of four needs to survive a basic but decent lifestyle in Grand Bahama. So what kind of sample size um, did you have for New Providence and Grand Bahama? So our sample size was very small. Um, we explored 30 homes, or we collected data on 30 homes in New Providence and 10 homes in Grand Bahama. Um, particularly in Grand Bahama, it was, considering Grand Bahama was affected by Dorian, we only had three areas wherein we could survey, and that included West End, Eight Mile Rock, and Freeport. And even driving past, our research team members said that, you know, they noticed cars were parked outside homes that had broken doors, broken windows, and, and didn't look, you know, appropriate for living. But um, so we, we tried to work with what we could have given the circumstances there, and also just the entire emotional health of the population over there at times, being sensitive to that. Um, and in New Providence, the inner city areas. And we also were able to collect data on the, that 30 homes included the immigrant population. We were able to collect some data on Haitians and Spanish, like Cuba, Dominican Republic uh, residents who are here in the Bahamas. So I know that there are some internationally accepted and appropriate uh, methodologies for conducting a, a living uh, wage study. But at the end of the day, you still have to take into consideration what is present on the ground in the country where the 
survey is conducted and what obtains specifically for New Providence and for Grand Bahama, what were those considerations for this study? So particularly just the Bahamas in general, we had to be quite sensitive to the high levels of debt that most persons, persons would have, as well as our need to also include the immigrant population, considering that the Haitian, for example, the Haitian community, for example, they occupy the two lowest quintile groups quintile. Of, of poverty. So we had to be considerate with that to also include them because of the fact that in the same arena, Haitians would also Patients would also take on the lower wage income jobs. So that's why we had to also make sure that we included them. And then for the high levels of debt, for instance, one of the first homes that we would have did our field work with was with a supervisor that had a government job. And he expressed to us that his, what his um, income was on a monthly basis. But then later on, we came to find out that his income was actually higher. But he presented to us this income because of the fact that he had so much debt, so much debt to cover. And so for him, it was just the money that he was able to work with. Now for New Providence, you know, we had to consider that persons would not be as open or would over-exaggerate their circumstances. So even in the case, like I said, with the supervisor would under-exaggerate their circumstances to, especially when it came to their living arrangements and their living standards. And this was likely because of the visibility of inequality due to the tourism sector as well as other factors. Sorry, if I may, Ms. Johnson, when you said Haitians, can you clarify? Mm -hmm. Do you mean Bahamians of Haitian heritage or do you mean undocumented mi immigrants, migrants? Now, our surveys, um, um, with, the, with our survey, we actually had both included. We had some Haitians that were illegal as well as Haitians that were documented, but we have to also take in into account that when we talk about the lower levels of poverty, those actually account for legal Haitians and as well as illegal, but mainly illegal Haitians. And because of the fact that they occupy, occupy such a large percentage of poverty, whereas they occupy, like I said, the two lower quintile groups, is that they would contribute overall to considering this living wage standard. What were the other highlights of this survey that are relevant for our discussion? What else is interesting and relevant for our listeners to know about your findings? So we think that key lessons would be that the current, the current minimum wage does not and does not, coincide, does not coincide with the cost of living in the country. And also that in essence, we cannot afford, with regard to the minimum wage, a decent standard of living. And even more so now that we're in this pandemic, it will offer shopping guidelines for larger organizations as well as individual homes for persons to determine how would they shop and also how would they determine or better manage more so their funding for the home on a monthly or weekly basis. It also highlights that we need to pay better attention to the Haitian community because of the fact that they occupy a lower percentage group of poverty, but they too deserve a decent standard of living. And also too, because of the fact that they also aid in contributing to the community as a whole. Another thing that I didn't highlight earlier is that within the Haitian community itself, which is something knowledgeable that I learned because I was able to actually interact with the Asian community, they actually pool their resources. So imagine that one household or two households or three households have it where they're working persons. They pool their resources and assist in buying larger quantities to aid the community within that in which they live in. And, and then this also, is important. Sorry, this wasn't a shanty town. Area right. type situation. No. The Haitian community that was surveyed was in an urban area of New Providence, but where a lot of, uh, where they lived, but it wasn't a shanty town. So just their families, they brought together their money, pooled their resources, and were able to get food items at wholesale prices, therefore thereby reducing the cost that they would have to pay on food individually, which is yeah. a brilliant strategy for managing right. um, finances and the cost of living expenses. That's and interesting, that's that's interesting that you should mention that because that's mm -hmm. in the mind of 
Bahamians of Chinese heritage. So now I'm trying, um, now I want to ask, <laughs> were they reflected? Were they, um, did you, were you able to survey any of them? No, I wasn't able, unfortunately, Chinese, no, I really wanted to target the Filipino audience or community. And I wasn't able to get the, them. However, we do, this study is in progress. We are expanding to the other islands and I do hope even we are looking forward to a Creole translation, but I do hope that we're able to capture the ethnic diversity, provided they are low wage workers um, and working, you know, more or less domestic jobs or uh, minimum wage jobs. We want to capture how they are living. Is this considered a baseline study? I would certainly hope so. We have submitted articles for journals for these findings to be uh, peer reviewed. Um, just as a, a double back shack. Also, the, the studies by the unions that I've heard about and the calls for studies by politicians, I actually have not seen the data and the, their, their evidence and their research to come up with their figure. I haven't seen that, but this study will be available on the website for anyone to download and to read through or scrutinize at their greatest pleasure. Um, to, to put forward, yeah, so to, give, to definitely be considered something um, as foundational to understanding cost of living expenses in the country. All right, and where they can find this uh, study in its entirety is at www.ub.edu.bs. Plug in Government and Public Policy Institute into the search bar, and that will take you to the GPPI page. And then you will see the uh, Bahamas Living Wages Study. Um, ladies, I also- on the upper left hand side. The upper left side. Uh, Thank a, yeah. Thank you so much for that. So what is the next step now? What the information that you've been able to generate, the data that you've been able to provide, what, what, what now? What's the next step? I know you indicated that you wanted to do similar studies for other islands in the Bahamas, but in terms of impacting public policy, what is next for the information that you, you've been able to provide in your survey results? All right. So, and I probably highlighted this a bit earlier in terms of affecting the VAT free list. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the items that are on, for example, no fruits or vegetables are on the VAT free list. But to have a nutritious diet, you would need to have some fruits and vegetables. So we picked the lowest cost items. And if those could be on the VAT free list, that would be a great poli public policy initiative. Also, um, you know, uh, one of our researchers, uh, William Fielding, also identified that a lot of items that the poor eat are actually not on the VAT free list either. But all of this would help to contribute to lowering the cost of living and lowering the amount of the living wage. Another public policy initiative could also be considering alternative housing options. So the lowest homes, the lowest cost homes that met standards we found in, you know, Mason's addition area and in its inner city area, um, there are currently restrictions on the height that can be built, but if you can level up homes in those areas where people can go upstairs, maybe two, three, four, five stories of homes um, in that area to capitalize upon the space and the cost, uh, that would be beneficial without require a change in the law on height. Um, another option, talk about increasing competition. How do we how do we decrease costs if we don't decide to implement a living wage? Right. How can we use this study to drive creative strategies to decrease costs. And that could be by figuring out ways to increase competition, be it electricity or utility expenses, food or the other essentials expenses, or to decrease food costs, encourage more homegrown food, or should we rediscuss joining a global trade organization, increase competition to decrease the cost of living. Those are some, pub some of the public policy ideas we came up with. Um, on how this study can be used to inspire a better life for low-wage workers in the Bahamas. 
Well, that's actually a very good note to end on. Um, do you want to offer any wrap-up comments, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Archer? We want to say thank you. Um, the University of the Bahamas, we are passionate about research. We are passionate about giving back to our community and learning and growing and teaching at the Government and Public Policy Institute. Please visit our website to see uh, some of the research that we have produced. Like Ms. Lundy said, www.ub.edu.bs forward slash GPPI for Government and Public Policy Institute. Um, check us out and we look forward and we hope to receive your response, your support, your criticisms, your critiques. As intellectuals, we thrive off of critiques and criticisms. We see it as making us better. So we look forward to it. Thank you for having us this Monday. It's been our pleasure to have you as guests on University Drive. We, we, we try to change the narrative and to bring thought leadership and to have on our show uh, people who are making a difference and making contributions that are relevant for us living in the Bahamas and as members of the global community. Thank you so much for joining us, Brittany Johnson and Leslie Archer. And you've been listening to University Drive. Join us again next week same station, same time for University Drive. I'm Tamika Lundy signing off for now. University Drive is a production of the Office of University Relations and the Communications and Creative Arts Academic Unit at University of the Bahamas. All rights reserved.